Okay, so 2009. This is when you first tried it or discovered it? or Oh, it's a total horror show mistake. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. So 2009, um, I was unemployed and feeling you like- You unemployed? How? Well, okay. Too much charisma, too much passion. Uh, yeah, because everything's working right now. That's why. <laughs> I'm not like this when things are not working. Sure, sure. Ask my husband of 22 years. Yeah. Um, uh, well, the, what had happened is um, I, I had had all these career changes and I got into the media business, again, by mistake. I had a coaching mm-hmm. business and um, Inc. Magazine was writing an article about coaches and they featured me in it and CNBC called. Got it. And that led to me doing some stuff with CNBC and um, I spent a year still coaching people and then doing some stuff for CNBC and then Fox called and they were interested in having me host a television show. Now, you got to understand, I'm from North Muskegon, Michigan. Mm hmm. I mean, the media business, Fox, <laughs> L.A., yeah. the closest thing I had ever seen to a celebrity, Lewis, was the Muskegon Lumberjacks, the farm <laughs> team, right? Right. From our, for, for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Yeah, the, my the dad, double-A team or whatever. Yeah, my dad was the hometown team. doc for the hockey team there. Right, right, right. So I thought, the mayor was a celebrity. wow, <laughs> my life's about to change. I'm about to be a celebrity. Wow, we're going to solve all, this is amazing, you know? So um, I was originally going to be hosting a, a show for Fox where we were making over small businesses. <clears throat> nice. Yeah, pretty cool, right? We show up, we like do extreme home makeover mm. for the office. Everybody's happy. We all know that doesn't solve business problems, <laughs> but it makes for a nice television show. By the time I get to LA, um, they've changed the format. It's now called Someone's Gotta Go, and I'm going to be firing people on national television from real jobs. Wow. Uh-huh. That sounds fun. Horrible. Oh, my gosh. Plus, we haven't told the offices that this is what we're doing. Oh, my gosh. So you show up in Act 1, and you've got everybody all like this because they think they're going to get new IKEA furniture and a paint job, and this is going to be the best thing in the world for their small business. Now, meanwhile, I'm a fourth-generation small business owner, so that's like my people. Grew up at a kitchen table with farmers and you know my mom at a retail store and my other grandparents were bakers and so when it comes to like the heart and soul and what's so important when you launch your own business and how personal it is i mean this was like gut-wrenching so i show up the first act you kick out the the owner of the company who then freaks out then all the employees freak out act number two we announce that somebody's getting fired and then that's that's the the bad news the good news is that i'm not picking we're going to have you vote somebody out. So oh it's Survivor in an office place. Oh, my goodness. So that sucks. When, when I learn all this, I, I have a panic attack, even though I'm on Zoloft. And I call the guy that got me the gig and say, you got to get me out of this. Like, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to mm-hmm. me. And he said, um, well, I'm sorry, but they've already cast the entire show and you're out there for five weeks and you don't have a choice. Or they're going to sue you. And oh I said, gosh. then fine, get me some Xanax because I don't think I can get through this thing. Like, this is awful. <laughs> Luckily... Um, we taped two episodes and um, legal tabled it. Mm. But here was the problem. I was attached to the show. And I only got paid if the show was shooting. Mm-hmm. So and being an entrepreneur, <laughs> I also kind of put, yes, yeah. put all my energy into this, <clears throat> shut down the coaching thing. Um, yeah. Uh, really thought that the, it also kind of negotiated a deal that was a sort of a back end deal thinking I'm a, fa- you know, entrepreneur always sure, thinking sure. about got to have Take a piece a of the action yes the, yeah, of course. What a, yeah that was a dumb move <laughs> um and i was in a contract for a year while they figured out what to do mm, so you couldn't do another show yeah so you know i just felt like i had made a, a huge mistake and i felt really embarrassed and i didn't know at the age of 41 what i should be doing with my life and while it's neat that i had jumped careers so many times i started to mm-hmm. feel like somebody that actually wasn't successful at all because I didn't have a career track. I had a bunch of jumps from one thing to another. Now, looking back, it makes perfect sense. But standing in the middle of the mess, it just felt like everything was caving in. Probably mm-hmm. just like when you were sleeping on your couch, Absolutely. feeling injured and like everything I thought that was about to happen isn't happening now. Meanwhile, my husband had opened up a restaurant business. It had been his dream. He worked in high tech and came home one day after getting laid off and said, I, I'm i never going to get on a plane and do a PowerPoint presentation for a company. I don't care about her own and I said great what's your plan and he said I'm gonna open a pizza restaurant and I Mm. looked at him and I said was there a trust fund that was part of this marriage that I was unaware of? Because I'm not quite sure how we're going to get the money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Did someone die? You got an insurance policy? Check. Yes. And he said no. And um, 
Uh, I then said the most famous lines of our 22 marriage, 22 year marriage, Lewis. I looked at him and I said, listen, buddy, inspiration is for strangers. You get your ass back to that job and you pay the mortgage and you forget the stream. You're not going to this. Wow. So we, well, because change is scary. Yeah. So we fought and he won. And the first one was a real home run. And he opened this, a pizza store. Oh, he did. Yeah, 40, 40 seats right outside of Boston, Massachusetts. He and his best friend. And they won did Best well. of Boston. It was incredible. What do you do when everything? they make money, though? They did on the first one. Okay. So what do you do when, when do everything's working? Woo, let's go all chips in. Let's put in the home equity line. Let's put wow. in the, the kids' college savings. Let's get friends and family. And because you're so excited, you, you think it's going to work. Yeah. So you go big, big, big. Well, the second one did not work at all. And it did not work at all so badly mm. that when it was finally closed, it was close to an $800,000 loss. And mm. it meant our entire home equity line, kids' college savings, everything went right down with it. Mm. That was right when... I lost the Fox show. So I'm unemployed. The liens start hitting the house. Um, the phone starts ringing all the time and it's collections calls. Mm. So you unplug that the phone. That would stress me out. Well, you just unplug the phone. Oh my I mean, that's gosh. how you deal with that. But I, 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 I remember like, there were, I remember two things from that period of my life that were really painful. And one was having to call the town and tell them that we could not afford the 175 bucks for our sixth grader to, play soccer so we needed to pull her out and wow. I remember there being times because I was so afraid to look at the checking account that I would stand at the grocery store and items would scan and I could just feel that wave of anxiety rising thinking I don't I don't think the check card's going to go through and so I would stand there I always had an excuse and it was to look at the person and go oh that's strange it just worked at the gas station oh my gosh because I, what would have been more empowering is to probably say, oh, well, I guess I don't have the money for this. Let's take this, this, and this. And just kind of like the easiest thing to do is to tell the truth. But I was so filled with shame. Yeah. So I started to develop this habit of hitting the snooze button. Because what would happen is the alarm would go off in the morning. And the first thing I would think about is all the problems that we had. And how awfully things had gone off the tracks. And you didn't want to deal with them. No, and I, and I also didn't know, I didn't know, I didn't think I could. And this goes back to the feelings. Like you, you think that you need to feel confident or courageous in order to get started. You don't. You actually just have to start. And that's the riddle of life. That lying in bed, hoping that you wake up some morning motivated to change. That's not the answer. You actually have to learn how to push yourself. You have to learn how to, how to leverage the power of your decisions. And you've got to learn how to take action when you don't f feel like it. Mm -hmm. Because every morning when I woke up, I did not feel confident. I felt like a loser. Yeah. I felt like the world's worst parent. I felt like I had failed at every single turn. I did not know if Chris and I could pull out of the spiral. I did not know if we were going to go bankrupt and lose the house and move from our community. I did not know if our marriage would survive. I knew I wanted it to. And see, this is the knowledge action gap. You can know what you want. You can know what you should be doing. But how do you make yourself do it when the feelings and the motivation isn't there, when all you got is fear? And so every night I would, I would lie in bed and I would say to myself, all right, that's it, Mel. Tomorrow, it's the new you. Tomorrow, you're going to wake up and be motivated. You're going you're gonna to get up. You're going to exercise like everybody says you should. You're going to meditate. You're going to get those kids on the bus. You're going to screw Fox. You're going to look for a job. You're going to cold call Cox Media, and you're going you're gonna to do auditions. Come on, girl. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. You're going to take a cold shower. Woo! You know, here we go. <laughs> and I meant it when I was saying it. Maybe it was the alcohol that was talking, but, but then I would wake up, and I didn't feel any of those things. Mm -hmm. So I would hit the snooze. And I would hit the snooze. Now, why was I hitting the snooze when I knew it wasn't the right decision? I'm going to tell you why. And this is something that I was blown away by when I discovered it. You don't make decisions with your goals. You don't make decisions with your prefrontal cortex. You don't make decisions with logic. Do you know how we make decisions? I didn't invent this. A neuroscientist by the name of Damasio, who does his research in Brazil, who gave an incredible <laughs> TED Talk and wrote about this forever and ever and ever. We make decisions with feelings. 95% of our decisions are made by how you feel in the moment. And that is the problem. 
You need to take control of the moment and leverage the power of your decisions and make them up here. Because when I was lying in bed, I wasn't saying to myself, I should get up because that's going to help me start my day right. I was saying, do I feel like getting up? No, you don't. No. Do you feel like making that cold call? No, you don't. Do you feel like doing that third set of reps? No, you don't. Do you feel like having that hard conversation? No, you don't. Do you feel like ending this relationship, whether it's in business or in your life, that is sucking you dry? No, you don't. We make decisions based on our feelings, and that is robbing you of joy and opportunity. And it is blinding you from the fact that all how you change your life is one five-second decision at a time. One push at a time. And if you, if you accept the fact that you may never feel ready and you may never feel motivated and you may never feel confident, you may never feel courageous and that's okay, but you can still push yourself forward. What happens over time is as you start mm. to see yourself becoming the person that takes action, that you start to see yourself becoming the kind of person that speaks even though your voice is shaking. You're the kind of person that, that, that has a bias toward moving instead of a bias toward thinking. Guess what happens? You build the skill of confidence and courage. And so what happened for me is I was stuck, Lewis. I mean, I was so stuck. I was on, I mean, we were heading straight for divorce. We were heading for bankruptcy. I knew I wanted to change things. Mm -hmm. And so one night I see this commercial. This is the stupidest story on the planet, but this is what happened. I see this commercial. And, you know, again, I, I also was drinking too much. I mean, I probably had a couple Manhattans in me. Sure. That's my drink. I'm from the Midwest, All just right. like you. Yeah. All right. Little Manhattan there. A little <laughs> bourbon. Um, and uh, there was a rocket ship launching. On a commercial. Yeah. yeah. And I had this instinct, this innovation, this disruptive idea, right? Oh, my God, Mel. That's the answer. Tomorrow morning, you're going to launch your ass out of bed like a rocket ship. You're going to move so fast, you can't even think about your problems. Dumb, right? Mm -hmm. Totally dumb. But See, worse. it's like this is the dumbest idea I've ever <laughs> but, heard. I cannot believe I have this chick on my podcast. No, I, understand. I understand it. You got to get moving first. Yes. That's the thing. You just got to wake up at 6 a.m. or whatever it is and go into the gym. And when you're in the gym, you're going to start moving the first weight. Yes. And then you'll start moving yes. the second Actually, weight. Actually, people, people <clears throat> use the five-second rule at the gym because you sure. know how much time people waste at the gym standing around thinking about the next thing? Probably 70% of the time. Five, right? four, three, two, one. So, yeah. so the next morning, the alarm goes off and nothing had changed in my life. I woke up. To the lean on the house, the fighting with Chris, the mm -hmm. unemployment, the lack of confidence, the lack of courage, the, like the whole thing. But I did something I had never done before. I went five, four, three, two, one, just like NASA. I actually counted. And then I stood up and I was like, <laughs> what the hell just happened? Uh -huh. what, what? That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. The next morning I used it again, it worked. The next morning I used it again, it worked. And then I started to notice something. And this is, this is one of those things. So we have, a, we have an 11-year-old son who has dyslexia. Mm. And when they finally diagnosed him, it was as if, of course. It was as if, like, how could we have possibly missed this? Are we the worst parents in the world? Mm. I mean, the kid can barely write. He can't cut his food. He doesn't read. Like, no wonder he doesn't do team sports. Mm. It was right under our nose. And what I'm about to tell you is right under everybody's nose. There's a five-second window between the instincts, the shoulds, the urges, the inner wisdom, the things that can change your life if you listen to it. You've got a five-second window from the moment you feel that instinct to move. And if you don't, your brain is actually designed to kill it. Five seconds is all you have. The second you hesitate it's actually, and you feel yourself hesitating, that is a moment of huge power because what's happened is you've just started to pull back from something that you need to lean into. And if you count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, and this is the neuroscience behind why this stupid little trick works, counting is, a, is an action. Mm. Counting backwards <clears throat> requires focus. It's also not a habit for you yet. So when you feel yourself hesitate, you're, you're, you're triggering your mind that something's up. Like Lewis didn't hesitate when he pulled on his pants. He didn't hesitate when he's drinking his coffee. He didn't hesitate when he walked out the door to the gym, but now he's hesitating to make that call. Your mind now goes into a cognitive bias called the spotlight effect. It magnifies whatever it was that you hesitated doing. Mm -hmm. The moment. And the yeah. moment. Yeah. Like all of a sudden you're like, hey, I don't feel like it. Like I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'll do it later. Right. 
and your mind is doing it because your mind's trying to protect you. Hesitation signals a red flag to your mind that something's up. Just that small hesitation. It's a habit that we all have. Should you hesitate if you're getting a tattoo? Yes. Should you hesitate if you're gambling? Yes. Should you hesitate if you are signing a legal document? Yes. You need your prefrontal cortex for those things. You need to interrupt it, make a power, make a decision. Should you hesitate on making a phone call? No. Should you hesitate on speaking up in a meeting? No. Should you hesitate when you feel yourself starting to procrastinate and you know you got work that you should get done? No, you shouldn't hesitate at all. Should you hesitate in saying the thing that you really feel in your heart? No, you shouldn't. Should you hesitate and edit yourself when you're talking? No, you shouldn't. But we've all trained ourselves to. So it's actually this habit of hesitating. You start catching yourself. It's a huge moment of power because you have a decision to make and you got to make it in the next five seconds. Are you going to go on autopilot and get trapped in your mind? Or are you going to five, four, three, two, one and awaken your prefrontal cortex and drive forward? Mm. So um, I started to use this rule as I noticed that every day, all day long, I had these moments of inner wisdom where... I would know that I needed to pick up the phone and stop isolating myself. Mm -hmm. I would know that I needed to call a bunch of media companies and start auditioning for radio show hosting gigs. I knew that I should get on, get out of bed on time. I knew I should stop myself before I snapped at Chris, mm -hmm. right? Self monitor. Yeah. I knew I should not feel, let the frustration be the things that was driving me. And so I started to use the rule all day long. Whenever I felt this, I should do this, five, four, three, two, one, and I would make myself do it. And slowly, five seconds at a time, my entire life start, started to change. And my husband used it in his business, and he and his business partner dove in. They went on to open seven more restaurants. Um, mm. I went on to launch and sell two <clears throat> businesses wow. and get recruited by CNN and join their team. I had a syndicated radio show that that um, ended up winning the Gracie Award, which is kind of the female media, you know, awards for nice. the number one talk show in the country. Um, and, you know, I never intended to tell anybody about the five second rule. First of all, because it's stupid. Right. I mean, <clears throat> come on. Count backwards. That's the dumbest That's thing. That's stupid to me, though. Well, Anything that works, works for me. That's true. You know what I mean? I'll take any stupid thing. That's true. <laughs> I mean, and so, I, but I also was like, how do you start talking about something like that, right? Yeah. So, um, I was asked to give a TED talk like six years ago, and TED six years ago, not the brand that it was today. Yeah. They weren't even putting the talks online yet. Really? Yeah. The TEDx wow. talks were not online yet. And so, that was the first speech I'd ever given in my life. If you want to see what somebody looks like having a panic attack for 21 <laughs> minutes straight, watch that speech. I was backstage and it was like one PhD after another going out there. I'm They're like, what the yeah, hell yeah. have I gotten myself into? This yeah. is the dumbest thing. Um, mm. And so at the very end, I wasn't even planning on talking about it. I say, oh, by the way, there's this thing I do. That's it. I don't even explain it. And you know why I didn't explain it, Lewis? I didn't know why it worked. Mm. So you didn't have the science, the research. You're just Zero. Like zero and then something crazy happened they put that talk online a year later and people started to write we've heard from more than a hundred thousand people in 90 countries that have written to us that are using the rule in ways big and small to change their lives to change their marriages to change their thinking patterns to grow their businesses um we know of 11 mm. people that have stopped themselves from killing themselves wow um, in the moment, there's a gentleman that we talk about in the book and you can see his social media posts in London. He was a, he was a veteran and he was suffering po from post-traumatic stress disorder and he boarded a ferry with the intention of jumping overboard. Mm. And he got to the railing and he was standing there and his inner wisdom kicked in. And this is another thing I want everybody watching to understand. I don't care what you're facing or how low you get. Your inner wisdom is always there. It is. And the thing is, is that we often don't listen to it. And so he's standing there intending to kill himself and that inner wisdom kicks in and he remembers the five second rule and he goes five, four, three, two, one and he turns and physically moves away from the railing and finds the first person working on the ferry and tells him that he's suicidal. Mm. Saved his life. Wow. He saved his life because he listened to the inner wisdom. And this is the other thing I love about this rule. It's not something to think about. It's a tool to use. So the part of the problem with a lot of the advice that I've found for me personally is that a lot of advice is all about kind of doing mental battle. Mm -hmm. And if I go upstairs, I'm behind enemy lines and I tend to get hijacked. <laughs> Right. So I love this tool because 54321 interrupts those patterns 
it actually prompts the part of the brain that I need in order to change. And it makes changing easier because I've now got my mind working for me instead of against me. And it gets me out of my head. And so um, I'm, I'm super excited to share this rule with people mm. because I now know not only that it's working, just not, not for me, it's working for people around the world. And, you know, in the book, it took me three years to write it. It's all the science behind the rule. Yeah. It's got more than 150 social media posts in it. So you see stories from around the world of people using it to end procrastination, to build confidence, to deepen their relationships, to launch businesses, to explode the sales. Why does it help with sales? I'll tell you why. Because you can't sell by thinking. Can Selling I? is about action. We have, we have um, um, <coughs> groups from companies around the world, sales teams, that put 54321 up on the wall. Really? I'm sure they hate me. That's cool. Yes, because what cold calling, it's a momentum thing. It if you is. stop and think, the phone is not getting, the dialing is not happening when you're thinking. Yeah. If you're thinking about all those no's you've been getting, yes. you're not going to want to do it again because yes. it doesn't feel good. Yes. And if you're in the middle of a negotiation or you're in the middle of a really difficult conversation, and again, remember what we said earlier? You cannot control your feelings that rise up. But you can always control how you think and what you do. So if you're in the middle of a difficult conversation and you feel those feelings come up that normally trigger you to start editing yourself or to censor yourself or to silence yourself or to think sabotaging thoughts in like a business negotiation, 54321, awaken the prefrontal cortex, mm. get back in the game. Well, thank you for having me. And you, I think of probably anybody on the planet will get what I'm about to say in your bones. Yeah. Because you understand the profound impact that the five second rule as a starting ritual has has had on millions of people's lives, helping them move from thinking yeah. to doing. And even sitting here, Jim, with you, which it's just an honor being such a fan of your work too, uh, to be here with you, even sitting here knowing the impact that the five second rule has had on millions of people's lives. Yeah. I'm going to tell you something. What's that? The high five habit is an even bigger deal with more profound change. And I uh, can't wait to unpack it, but I'll tell you personally, I use the five second rule to turn my life around, mm -hmm. to go from being bankrupt to being extraordinarily successful, to changing every habit I have, to improving my marriage. It got me into action, but I'll tell you what it never did. It never silenced the critic in my head that I lived with. Mm. It never ended the relentless beatdown that I was giving myself. And it never broke the habit that I had of constantly hating myself or focusing on the things that weren't working instead of celebrating myself and focusing on the things that were. And the high five habit cuts right down through all that noise and reconnects you with the you that's in there, with the confidence that is your birthright. And the way that it literally reprograms your mind is breathtaking. Well, you know, I we talk a lot about morning routines, and this was the, the easiest thing to add to my morning routine that's given me so much in, in return. And uh, not, not just in terms of in, the, in a short period of time, you know, in terms of the ripple of it, but even just immediately, I, you know, just celebrating my, myself um, in the, in the bathroom mirror. And what we could, we could talk about how that, how that works. I'm also, by the way, pulling back a big fan of just counting down from five, you know, what getting myself out of bed or getting myself to put on my, my running shoes. And so I could see, I could see the difference um, in how they complement each other so well. And so maybe you could walk our listeners through this. And I would highly recommend everyone. I mean, our audience loves to read to make sure you get your copy also as well. Well, so it's very simple. And since I know that your listeners want to get right into the science and right into what to do, I'm not even going to tell you the story because I did not set out to create this. I created the high five habit on a morning that everybody can relate to a morning where life felt overwhelming a morning where I felt defeated, a morning where I felt sort of stuck and dreading the day. And I was standing there brushing my teeth, Jim, and I catch my reflection in the mirror and I think, oh, you look like hell. 
And then all of a sudden I started to criticize the way that I looked, like the dark circles under my eyes, the the bags under my like kind of chin and neck and one boobs hanging lower than the other. And then once your thoughts go negative, they kind of take you down. So now I'm thinking about my day ahead and I'm beating myself up. Why did I get up so late? And I've only got eight minutes to the first mm-hmm. Zoom call and the dog hasn't even been walked. And you just said something interesting. It's an easy thing. The high five habit is an easy thing to add to the morning routine. We all talk a lot about morning routines. It wasn't until I discovered this that I realized there was a piece to my morning routine I was not even aware of, a habit that I needed to break, Jim, Mm. a habit that gratitude and exercise and all this stuff was not actually erasing, a habit of standing before the bathroom mirror and either ignoring the human being you see in the mirror or Mm. criticizing them. That is how we start our day. 91% of women don't like how they look. 50% of us can't even look in the mirror. I know it's true for men too. We stand in judgment. And so what happened for me this morning, here's the high five habit. It is profoundly simple. It's going to change your life. The second you're done brushing your teeth, and I want you to do it right after you brush your teeth, because I want you to stack this habit with something you're already doing. Cause you know, cause you listen to this podcast that It's the fastest way to learn a new behavior. Let's get the gunk out of your teeth so you don't spread dragon breath on everybody. Now let's get the gunk out of your head so you're not spreading negativity throughout your day. As you stand in front of the mirror, I want you to leverage a little piece of research from Harvard. New research shows that if you take less than a minute and you intentionally think about the day ahead and how you're going to show up as a leader, it changes your productivity, your focus, how you show up, and your ability to impact people. Let's throw that out the window in terms of being a leader and let's look in the mirror and let's use that for ourselves to improve our own lives. I want you to take a second and I want you to realize there's actually two people in the bathroom every morning, Jim. There's you and there's a human being in the mirror that's been waiting for you Mm. to wake up and realize they need you. They're trying hard. They've got a good heart. They need your support and your encouragement. They need you to see them. They need you to love them. That is literally what I'm talking about when I talk about the high five habit, that you wake up and recognize there is a person you go through life with that stares you back in the mirror every morning, and your habit right now is to tear them down or ignore them. And I want you to set an intention, and I want you to look at them in the morning. And this is going to feel weird because you're going to realize I've never actually asked myself this question. And here's the question. What is that person in the mirror? What is she or he or they? What do they need from me today? Mm -hmm. We think about it for work, for our families, for everybody else. You've never stopped and asked yourself, looking at yourself in the mirror. How do I need to show up for that person today? Then, as you've got that intention, despite the fact that it feels weird, despite the fact that you're going to resist this, and we can talk about why you're going to feel most likely resistance, I then want you to raise your hand, and I want you to high-five the reflection. And what's amazing about this new habit, Jim, is your brain and your nervous system are already designed to do the work for you. Mm -hmm. Because also, I mean, you think about how we high five other people, you know, throughout the day and to celebrate them, to, to encourage them, but we're not always doing that. I mean, it's interesting because no no amount of love is enough to fill the yearning over that our soul requires um, from ourselves. Right. You know, when do we work daily? on being in love with that person in the mirror who has been through so much, but is, but is still standing. Yeah. And think about some of the habits that we know based on research, change your life. Meditation. Meditation is profoundly important. The benefits you talk about all the time, meditation develops self-awareness. It also Mm -hmm. helps you learn how to be non-reactive to your thoughts, but it doesn't change your default thoughts. Gratitude. Also hugely important, tremendous benefit. Yes, you should have a gratitude practice. However, 
almost all of us, when we practice gratitude, we think about things outside of ourselves that we're grateful for. And so the high five habit is about bringing the power back in house. It's about giving you a science backed tool that will teach you through a simple action, how to support, how to love, how to encourage, how to celebrate yourself every single day. And let me explain the science because this is where things get crazy. The reason why this works is because of the programming that's already in your brain. So you have a lifetime of giving and receiving high fives. In fact, Jim, when somebody high fives you or you high five somebody else, what is the gesture alone of a high five? Tell somebody else. That they, they are extraordinary. They are amazing. Congratulations. You, you, you know, you're, you're, you're winning, you know. Exactly. Exactly. You don't ever high five somebody and say, I hate you. You always <laughs> high five and you're like, I love you. We got this. No problem. You're, you know, go get them. You're going to win. Even if somebody just blew it, you high yeah. five them and it's like, shake it off. Come on. I still yeah. believe in you. Let's go. And so all of that programming is right here in the interior of your brain. It's in your basal ganglia. It is in your subconscious. It is sitting there and it is married to the action of high fiving. So what happens is when you stand there, you set this intention, you're with yourself, you see yourself, you feel the resistance, you ignore the resistance, you go to high five yourself, your brain's like, oh, I know what this gesture means. It activates the subconscious programming. It silences the critic and the beatdown. You can't think anything but positive thoughts. It's impossible neurologically because of the programming already in your brain. And then over time, if you do this, give me just five days, you do this five days in a row, fight through the weirdness because it's new and the resistance because you have the opposite habit, you judge yourself, you reject yourself. When you high five yourself, it silences that, it activates the programming that's already in your brain and it starts to marry it with your own reflection. And that's not all. I talked to our buddy, Dr. Amen the other day, he went bananas when he heard about this. He's like, <laughs> Mel, holy cow. Do you realize you also get a boost in your mood because when you high five other people, you get a dopamine drip. So you get a dopamine drip when you do this to yourself. He also said, you know how when you come into the bathroom and you're kind of dragging in the energy and when you high five yourself, whether it's because you laugh or because you just kind of feel good, you get this little like pep in your step. So you start your day feeling slightly more energized. I'm like, yeah, Dr. Amon, tell me about that. He said, well, that's your nervous system. Your nervous system is encoded with celebratory energy. When you cross the finish line, you raise your hands. When yeah. your favorite team scores, you raise your hands. When you say hello to somebody, you raise your hands. When you hug somebody, you raise your hands. When you high five, you raise your hands. Your nervous system remembers it. That's where the energy comes from. The coolest thing about the high five habit, Jim, is the programming is already in you because you've been doing this your whole life for everybody else. Yeah. And when we are hardwired for this hard wired. In fact, when you were born, DNA in your DNA was celebration and joy. Little kids, when you see them in front of a mirror, they don't step back and go, my thighs are fat, man, I'm a loser. They don't do that. They spin, they high five the mirror, they kiss the mirror, they love themselves. This is your birthright. It was your life experience that taught you to judge and reject yourself. And I'm here to tell you this simple habit of standing before the mirror and raising your hand and high-fiving yourself like you so willingly do for everybody else. Yeah. You don't have to say a thing. You can have resistance. You can feel that it's weird. You can literally reject it in your mind as you start to do it. And you will, you will experience massive transformation as you complete the gesture because your mind is wired for this. You know, my husband, Jim, a lot of people know the story because it was his restaurant business failing that rocketed us into this personal crisis. And that's when I invented the five second rule. Well, his best friend and he worked at that restaurant business for seven years. And at the end of the seven years, they sold it for a song to a new investor. And it, our best friend, his business partner, was able to shrug and go, okay, well, that's entrepreneurship. I'm very proud of what we did. Uh, I'm proud of how hard we worked. And, you know, did we return the profit we wanted? No, but I'm still proud of myself. 
My husband couldn't do that. My husband said, I failed. Mm -hmm. Do you know, for seven years, he has looked in the mirror every morning, Jim, like so many of us do, and dragged his past in there and said, because this thing in my past, I am a failure. I am unworthy. Mm. I am unlovable. When I first started this high five thing in April of 2020 to pick myself up after getting fired from my dream job as a talk show host and in the throes of the pandemic and my kids in crisis and the world in crisis and just feeling overwhelmed, Chris couldn't do it. And the reason why I couldn't do it is the reason why everybody's resistant to doing it. It's because he was dragging all of that judgment and everything from his past into the bathroom every morning. Mm. And he was saying, because of that experience, I don't see a human being that's worthy of celebration. So if you've experienced trauma or abuse or discrimination, or you've been abandoned, or you know, you're a human being and you've done things you've regretted, or you wish you could change and you'd forgive Jim or me for it, but you stand in judgment of yourself, you will resist this. Because right now you see a human being who doesn't deserve celebration. If you're like Jim and I, and you are very much achievement driven, you may realize as you resist this, that you don't celebrate yourself unless you've done something, unless you've worked out, yeah. unless you've got yeah. the money in the bank, unless you're driving the Range Rover, unless you fix that thing. And what I'm here to tell you is we got it all opposite, Jim. Yeah. You see, we've been withholding the very support and celebration that we need in order to feel inspired, encouraged, and motivated to right. take the actions that change our life. Right. First of all, the biggest failure of my life is what led me to discovering the five second rule, which is the basis of my entire media business. It was the first book I put out. Um, I hit rock bottom in uh, 2008. I'm a lot older than you two. I'm like your older, uh, saucier <laughs> sister. You probably think it. that I, yes, you better have your seatbelts on I'll because I'm ready. Ready. here we go. This is going to be a um, <laughs> No, I hit rock bottom. My husband's restaurant business was failing and I had been uh, laid off. The recession hit the United States and I found myself at the age of 41 with three kids under the age of 10, unemployed, and nearly a million dollars in debt. Wow. We had secured the restaurant business by cashing out our life savings, the kids' college plans. We had taken out a home equity line because, hell, that's free money. We had cashed out our credit cards. We had shoved it all in, and the first uh, location had done dynamite, and the next two were complete dogs. And um, when failure hit, because I never dreamt that at 41, I would be facing bankruptcy, divorce, and a drinking problem. So when failure hit, I faced my issues like a lot of high-functioning people do, and that is by screaming at my husband and blaming everything on him and drinking myself into the ground, avoiding my problems and hiding from my friends. That's basically what I did. That does not sound like the Mel Robbins you know. And um, I knew what to do. And this is the kind of central thesis of the work that I'm putting out into the world and the things that I'm sharing. We all know what we need to do. We don't have a fucking clue how to make ourselves do it. Mm -hmm. When you're afraid, when you're anxious, when you're beaten down, when you're doubting yourself, when you're jealous, when you're insecure, those states, whether they're emotional or mental, they drag you down. And so at the age of 41, I would wake up every morning, you two, and I would be pinned to my bed by anxiety. It was like a gravity blanket that was just pinning me down. And I would stare at the ceiling and I would think about my problems and I would think about um, what a failure I was. And I felt like the world's worst mom. And we lived in this really nice suburb outside of Boston. And so everywhere I looked, I saw people who were successful and people who had nice cars. And I could not pay for groceries. I had to ask my father to pay for our mortgage while we were literally trying to figure out what to do. And that was the moment that I discovered the five second rule by mistake, by mistake, you two. So I was a lawyer. I then got into kind of the first dot com wave. I never intended to become a motivational speaker. I never thought about writing a book. I had to save my own ass 
because I realized nobody was going to come and do this for me. And every night I would sit there and I would give myself a pep talk. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like this in your life where you're like, all right, that's it. Tomorrow morning, I am changing. Tomorrow morning, I'm getting out of bed. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to stop drinking. I'm not going to be a bitch to my husband. I'm going to look for a job. I'm going to tell my friends the truth about what's going on. I am the new Mel. And then the next morning I'd wake up and the old, shitty, drunk, angry, bitchy Mel would still be there. And I would continue to feel stuck. And then one night as I was sitting there giving myself this talk that I got to change, I saw this rocket launch at the end of a commercial. And I thought, that's it. That's the secret. Tomorrow morning when the alarm goes off, instead of lying there and letting that anxiety and fear consume me, I'm going to launch myself out of bed like a rocket. I'm going to move so fast that I'm not going to be in that bed when that anxiety hits. Now, look, I'd had four Burmid Manhattans that night, so it was probably the alcohol that gave me that idea <laughs> because that is the dumbest thing that anybody has ever said in their entire life, right? Well, the next morning, for whatever reason, the alarm goes off, and I remembered the rocket launch, and I started counting backwards, five, four, three, two, one, and I stood up, and that was the beginning. And I used it in secret for three years, to five, four, three, two, one, push myself to take action, five, four, three, two, one, put myself in pause and not scream at Chris. And slowly but surely, one decision at a time, my whole life changed. I picked up the phone and networked until I got a job. I uh, start, st not stopped drinking entirely, but could stop after a glass of wine or a Manhattan instead of like drowning myself in it. Uh, five, four, three, two, one, I was pushing myself forward and exercising and telling the truth and working on my marriage. And then um, in 2011, somebody asked me uh, if I would be willing to give a talk about career change because I had changed my career so many different times. And it was at a thing I had never heard of called TEDx. And it was one of the first TEDx conferences ever. So there was no real formal vetting process. <laughs> and it was the first time I had ever stepped on a stage. Yes, I had been a, a criminal defense attorney, but it's very different to talk to a jury and a judge than to stand on a stage and stare out into an auditorium with a bunch of people with their arms crossed looking at you. I get out there. The speech is about changing your career, right? Getting out of your own way. It was not about the five second rule. In fact, I was not going to talk about it because telling people you can change your life by counting backwards from five sounds like the stupidest thing you've ever heard in your entire life. I had no idea why it worked. I was just using it in secret. So I start that speech. I basically have a 21 minute long panic attack on stage. If you look closely, you will see the neck rash that grows through the entire TED talk. And at the very end, I forget how to end it. And I pause and I say, oh, there's this thing I do. I call it the five second rule. The moment you have an instinct to move, you got to move within five seconds before your brain kills it. I was so disassociated, you two. I gave out my email address on stage <laughs> and then left the stage. A year passes. I go on with my life. I say, I'm never giving a speech again. That was the worst thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> TEDx uploads it. I don't even know it's online. Another year goes by. So now it's 2013. And I'm starting to get messages on Facebook about some speech I gave in San Francisco. And I'm replying like, oh, were you there? <laughs> That's how this all began. And then I gave speeches in 2013 for free at women's conferences. And then somebody came up to me at the end of the Pennsylvania Women's Conference and said, Hey, I spoke in the morning and I loved your session. Can I ask you a question, speaker to speaker? And I said, sure. And they said, did you get your check yet? And I said, check? <laughs> you got paid for that? And she looked at me in horror and said, you didn't? And I was like, no. I didn't even know that normal people got paid. To stand, I thought you had to be a celebrity or a best-selling author. I did not know that this was a thing that you could do. One of the things I love about Mel is that she's not someone that just pulls things out of books and regurgitates things. Like She literally takes time to do re real research and provide like real techniques and real how-tos that are, that are actually science-backed. 
But the one that changed her entire career, that has impacted millions of lives, is called the five second rule. So we're gonna get into the whole philosophy and how did she actually create the five second rule and all about how it can be used in your personal life as well, your business. What I really admire um, getting towards, talking about that five second rule is how it's, you, you know, there's a lot of people that give advice but you're the first that I've really, that I, I love that like, it's all science backed. I mean, this isn't just something that you whipped up and, you know, decided to, to kind of just create from a branding perspective. I mean, there's obviously, a, it's amazing how you branded yourself and how you branded the five second rule, but it's, I love how it is all science backed. A lot of the philosophy, a lot of the techniques. Everything we think. talk about has yeah. to be proven. Right. Everything. I love that. I don't give you some bullshit I've read in a book or something that I've read on yeah. Instagram the only things that we share are things that are backed by science, that have been researched, yeah. that we have seen working in our own lives, that we see working for our audience. And I think that is critical because let's face it, anybody can put up a inspirational quote right. you know, that they've read from somebody else. Anybody can tell you to you know, be positive or do this or put in the work or hustle or whatever the hell it may be. At the end of the day, it's just talk. Yeah. You have to know how. Yeah. And I also am, you know, somebody who is a little bit cynical. So, you know, I, I'm sort of embarrassed that I'm in self-help on some level because it yeah. sounds stupid, right? You know, I mean, I come from, I, I, I mean, I, I'm older than you. I'm almost 50. Self-help had a really bad name yeah. 20 years ago. Yeah. And I also am Ivy League yeah. lawyer. Yeah. And... I um, am an entrepreneur. Yeah. There's a lot of bullshit. I mean, there's I, a lot of there's a lot of fake people yeah, out for there. For sure, I, I that had, are uh, renting houses and yeah. Ferraris <laughs> and telling you if you use their click funnel strategy or whatever strategy yes, that, that you'll be rich like they are. And yeah, you may and chase the money if it energizes you. Yeah. But there's a lot of smoke and mirrors. I agree. And so yes. if you're going to follow influencers and you're going to look to other people for advice remember one thing would you actually trade lives with them would you actually want to do what they're doing yeah. with their life and if the answer is yes then listen yes but then always come back and reflect on whether or not that advice feels true for you yeah and adjust it because the things that I'm saying, they work for me and I know they work for millions of people, but they might not work for you based on your mental health, right. based on your financial situation, based on uh, what's going on with your family. The timing might not be right. You might not be mentally capable of doing these things without professional help. So you have to be responsible for yourself. Yeah. And that's the most important thing about personal development. Yeah. We're here to inspire you and give you things to think about in the hopes that you will take them back into your lives and try them and figure out what works for you. So let's get into that a little bit because I think that that's what I think you've done better than most. And you and let's get into the five second rule because I feel yep. our entire life is based off these choices. I had uh -huh. just posted about it today. And um, you know, you have this philosophy. Can you, for those that haven't read the book yet, yep. and I wanna get into how this integrates into both personal and into business. Sure. But what is the five second rule? So the five second rule is a self coaching tool. That's all that it is. Okay. And it's something that I invented literally 20 feet from here in my bedroom, although that bedroom wasn't built back then. Um, we're in the new section of the house. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. The old section uh, did not look like this. Um, uh, my husband, it was something that I invented to beat my habit of hitting the snooze button. Mm. And the way that it works is very simple. The moment that you need to do something and you can feel yourself hesitating and you can feel the excuses rolling in, count backwards to yourself, five, four, three, two, one, and something weird will happen. The moment you get to one, you'll actually move. And I invented it by mistake. I invented it during, I think, the worst moment of my life, which was uh, 2008, Chris and I, my husband of 22 years, we were about to lose everything. Wow. His restaurant business was going under. I had just been um, 
fired from a job, my first job in the media business. So I was just wallowing in self-doubt because I thought, boy, have I really screwed up. Um, I had changed my career, taken a risk, gone into the media business. It didn't work out. I felt like a total loser. I felt like I made a big mistake. Um, we had three children, mortgage to pay. Um, the entire house had been used to leverage the business. So had our life savings. So had the kids' college savings. I mean, just on the verge of losing it all. Chris was sleeping on the couch. And I just couldn't get out of bed. And so I invented this thing, the five-second rule one night when I saw a rocket ship fly across a television screen at the end of a commercial, and it gave me this idea. And the idea was, hmm, I wonder if I launched myself out of bed so fast, I wonder if I could move fast enough that I could beat the self-doubt and anxiety that I felt every single morning when I would wake up. And it was really that dumb and that simple of an idea. And um, for whatever reason, uh, when the alarm went off that next morning, what happened is what happens to all of us all day long. Inspiration strikes, so the alarm goes off, and use the, uh, the snoo use the alarm clock as a metaphor for those moments when you know you should do something. And the alarm goes off, and what's interesting is most of us don't have a problem with what we need to do. It's how we make ourselves do the shit that's hard. So the alarm went off and immediately my mind woke up and my mind started spinning as our minds do. Yeah. And I started immediately thinking like most of us do when the alarm goes off, fuck, I don't want to get up. I don't, you know, it's cold. I don't want to get face the day. I'm unemployed. And then the body starts to kind of get a little tense when anxiety comes in or you start to feel overwhelmed about the shit you got to deal with. And I felt myself reaching for the snooze alarm like I always did. But that morning I went five, four, three, two, one. And by the time I hit one, I was standing up and I was kind of freaked out because why would something so simple work? But I went on with my day and um, I used it the next morning and the next morning and the next morning. And then I started to wonder, God, I, I see that it works as a cheat for the alarm clock, but I wonder if it could work for other things. So I started to use it for every moment in my life where I knew what to do, but I didn't feel like it. Five, four, three, two, one, literally just decimates any excuse that you have. And as I started to use it in my life to five, four, three, two, one, not be an asshole to Chris. Five, four, three, two, one, turn and walk away from the bourbon and not have a drink. Five, four, three, two, one, pick up the phone and network. Five, four, three, two, one, walk out the door and go to the gym. Um, everything changed because my decisions changed. And the thing that was interesting about that period of my life is that there were a couple things that is true for all of us that got revealed to me in that moment. And here's what's true for all of us. Number one, our life is defined by our decisions. Number two, most of us know what we should be doing. Right. Number three, if you're in a situation where you should do something and the excuses roll in, you only have five fucking seconds before the excuses win. Yeah. That's it. And it has to do with how your brain is designed. And so I started seeing this five second window everywhere everywhere. You walk into a networking meeting and the five second window is right there because you look around and you see all these people you should talk to and you feel yourself freeze. Five, four, three, two, one, and you can start walking. If you're trying to sell something, the five second window is always there because you either have a phone you need to pick up and make a phone call or you have a person you need to talk to. But instead of doing it, that five second window's right there and the excuses roll in and then you're not doing it. Yep. And so... It's I almost started, like we talk ourselves out of it, right? After five seconds, like, why not to do it? All well, these and, then, and then it's even more sophisticated than that, is which, which is what I discovered. And th what's more sophisticated about it is that you have two modes to your brain. You have the prefrontal cortex, which is the mode of your brain. It's the front part of your brain that does all your strategic planning, your decision making, your not all your decision making. That's wrong. It does your intentional decision making, conscious decision making. Um, it's what you're using when you're acting with courage. It's what you're using when you are learning anything new. If you've ever taken a standardized test, 
When you walk out of a standardized test, what do you have? You have a freaking headache because you've been using this part of your brain. That's the one part. The other part is the interior part of your brain, which automates everything. It's where self-doubt is. It's where habits are. It's where automated decision-making is. It's where every negative bullshit shit that we do, it's stuck right here. So what the five second rule is actually doing on a very sophisticated level is it's switching off this part and awakening the part that gives you control. And so the problem with our excuses, if you want to get into the brain science, is that if you start to think and you start to think, I feel tired or I don't want to, or I'm too stressed out or now's not the right time, that becomes automatic and it gets encoded right here. So part of the problem with our excuses is that when you stop and think and hesitate, you trigger your brain to automatically talk you out of it. That's the problem. It's not the excuses. It's that your brain has done it over and over and now it takes over. Right. So I invented the world's um, most powerful cheat code for the brain. <laughs> One night when I was drunk, sitting in my living room watching television. That's the story. And you know, I never intended to tell anybody. Never. Because it sounds dumb and I didn't know why it worked. And, um, but I started using it, Chris started using it. One decision at a time, my life turned around. One decision at a time, his life and restaurant business turned around. Um, we started Inspire 52 and sold it. I cold called my way into a radio audition. 54321, 54321, landed that. It became a syndicated show. 54321, and I'm doing the work to become better at radio, which requires you to listen to what you're doing, which sucks having to hear yourself. 54321, 54321. CNN starts calling because I'm winning all these awards. And my life was cranking. When I was on CNN, I wasn't even thinking about doing a speaking thing. Yeah. Um, and then people started to write. Wow. A quarter of a million of them in 90 countries have written to us. Those are the people that emailed, by the way. That's not all the social media stuff. And yeah. so it became so overwhelming because I, of course, was answering all these emails. Yeah. Because um, if you were going to take the time to I write, I think when you me, like try to create something, that's when it doesn't work. But then when you think, oh, this isn't the, this isn't going to be the thing that anyone cares about. This is stupid. It's fascinating. But it always ends up being that thing that you, that we think is not going to be the one that right? uh, that relates. That's to why anyone. you got to follow what energizes you. Yeah. People can smell a phony a million miles away. Yep. And what will make you successful is following the thing that naturally energizes you because it's unique to you. Yeah. And when your energy is expansive, you will naturally attract people that want that same feeling. Yeah. It's really that simple. It doesn't feel that simple when you're stuck. I get that. Yeah. And I can sit here and say it's that simple but I'm 20 some years into the trajectory of figuring it out. Yeah. But hell, I wish I had known this shit when I was 18. Yeah. I would have saved myself a world of hurt. You know, so many of you have reached out to me talking to me about how to solve your anxiety or your depression. And mental health awareness is so important to me, especially this season, talking about conscious creators. And Mel is somebody that I've really, truly respected because she has helped so many people to heal themselves and solve their anxiety. Um, some of the most severe anxiety attacks and panic attacks that some of her fans have faced. Now, me personally, not only have I faced depression in my life, but most recently I've really suffered from anxiety. We're about to get into how Mel feels this is not a disease. This is not something that you can allow to control your life. You have a choice. You can overcome it. And we're going to get into how she goes about solving this epidemic that we're all facing. So when you first start using the five second rule, most people use it to get to the gym, to make sales calls, to get up on time, to have tough conversations, to do the physical stuff. Yeah. But the real mojo is to use it to rewire your mindset. Okay. And so if you're somebody that suffers from anxiety, first of all, here's what you need to know. It's not a disease, period. It's not a disease. There are people that suffer from acute anxiety disorder. They should seek professional help. There's incredible medication that works. I'm talking to the people that suffer from more general 
anxiety that people feel in their day-to-day -day lives right. or that are brought on by a specific situation. I'm also speaking from um, specific personal experience and the fact that we know of hundreds of thousands of people who've actually cured their anxiety right. because of what I teach. So here's what you need to understand. Anxiety always begins with a worry, always. It begins with a thought that is triggered by something. So if you suffer from anxiety, you wake up in the morning and your mind spins, you lay in bed at night and your mind spins, you walk into work and you feel anxious in your body. I want you to write down all the things that trigger you to feel anxious. Interestingly, another major trigger <clears throat> is being home or going home and that moment right before your partner walks in the door. If you feel anxious, when your partner's about to walk in or you're about to walk into your own home, that is a major signal that you're in the wrong relationship, that there is something incredibly off and you either need to get into counseling, but that is one that we hear a lot about. Wow. Um, because you're walking into a situation mm. that feels uncertain. Yeah. A lot of people, by the way, had parents that were abusive or parents that were yellers. So they also are experiencing ghosts from the childhood yeah. of it's five o'clock, dad's about to come home and pour a drink and everybody's on edge. Yeah. So write down the triggers, okay? Because having, tr having kind of the triggers ahead of time will help you come up with a plan for how you're going to catch yourself when your mind defaults to the automatic ways that it thinks. Then what I want you to write down next to the trigger is what exactly are you worried about? So having the trigger and then the, what do I worry about? I worry that my boss is gonna yell. I worry that my partner's gonna yell. I worry that I'm gonna get in trouble. I worry that um, you know my friends are gonna laugh at me. I worry that I'm gonna be a, whatever the fuck it may be. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna write down what I call an anchor thought. An anchor thought is something that weighs you down and it makes you excited. And so here's how the strategy works with the five second rule. The next time you're in a situation, and let's just use the example of pulling into your own driveway or your own apartment, and maybe you've got issues with your boyfriend or girlfriend or your roommate, and that makes you unsettled. You're, the second you pull in and you feel the trigger, you're gonna go five, four, three, two, one, because I wanna interrupt your mind from going into the fuck, 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 I don't like, what, what if I, blah, blah. and then you're gonna drop in the anchor thought of the last time that you and your roommate really got along well, or the last time that you stood up for yourself and it went fine. And or your gonna, puppy. Yeah, or a puppy or whatever. <laughs> and you're gonna say, I'm so excited to deal with this. Yeah. And then you're going to get out of your car, even though your body is gonna feel a little unsettled and your mind's gonna race, go five, four, three, two, one, if you start to like be like, uh, but what, uh, uh, and then walk in the door. And what I'm teaching you to do is to not let your mind hijack you. Right. And it's very important because there's a very tight nexus between your habit of worrying and spiraling your thoughts and the way your body starts to amp up. And so we want to settle your mind so we don't agitate your body. You got it? Yeah. And so if you start to practice that over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, and for you 18-year-olds that are watching this, use this with the nerves that you have about what you're gonna do with your life. Use this when you catch yourself worrying about college applications because worrying about the applications won't get them done. Worrying about what your friends are doing won't make it happen. Worrying about what you're gonna be doing when you're 25 or how you're gonna make money, it's not gonna help you make money right now. It's only gonna make you miserable. Right. So five, four, three, two, one, cut off that habit. Yeah. That'll stabilize your body and then go to a vision of you at the age of 25 driving a car that you think is cool and hanging out with a friend that's cool and saying to yourself, I'm so excited because I know I'm going to figure it out. Because you don't need to worry about that shit right now. Yeah. But it becomes a habit that destroys your year this year. So you have a choice over what you think about. Yeah. We all do. By counting backwards, the, the uh, kind of cheat code that you're doing in your mind is you are interrupting what are called habit loops that get encoded in the central part of your brain, and you are starting up the prefrontal cortex. It's a little trick that causes focus, and it's, it's a lot like having a mantra, because mm -hmm. you're shifting gears, but the thing about having a mantra is, and I suppose that as you count backwards more and more and more, you become used to yeah. it, but it becomes a habit that triggers action.
So what you do is you go five, four, three, two, one, cut off this part of the brain, awaken this part of the brain, and then move. And what happens with the counting backwards is there's nowhere to go after one. And your mind is socialized in a countdown situation to go. Yep. And so um, counting up won't work because you can keep you go going. forever. <laughs> and you do it in many aspects of your life, so it's actually not something that requires any focus. Mm. See, the prefrontal cortex and functional MRIs is, is lit up like a Christmas tree when you're doing something that requires courage, when you're engaged in strategic thinking, or when you're learning a new behavior. Uh -huh. So we've invented, or I created a, a little cheat for switching the gears manually between the part of the brain that actually makes changing difficult and keeps you stuck, and the part of the brain that you need in order to change. So, five, four, three, two, one. Yeah. And then you engage in the behavior that you're afraid of or that the crocodile brain part is saying, uh -huh. don't do this yeah. or this yeah. is going to be scary yeah. or bad. Or... Yeah. So if you're sitting with a client who um, constantly scope creeps on you and you know you want to say something, but you start to feel that hesitation, you're about to chicken out, five, four, three, two, one. And you say, hey, this is outside the scope of what we talked yeah. about. It's not going to, it's yes. not a huge deal, but we just need to redefine yes. the scope to it. Yeah, you say whatever. Or if you have a drinking problem and you feel yourself drawn toward it, 54321 interrupts the habit of grabbing for it based on whatever trigger made you want to have the drink, and you turn and you move away from it. So it is a way to have courage in the moment. It's a way to have self control in the moment. It's a way to be present and, you know, Awake in the moment, it's a way to interrupt patterns of behavior. I use it right now for my tone of voice. Mm -hmm. um, I use it because um, I get like in the zone and then I have this edge to my tone of voice that I really don't like. And the more that we do video and I see it, the more I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't want to sound like that. Um, I use it for sure to exercise because I hate to exercise. I still eight years later, I mean, I, I discovered this thing in 2008 by mistake trying to beat my habit of hitting the snooze alarm. Incredible. Yeah, and um, I still every day use it every single morning to get out of bed. Every single morning. I hate getting out of bed. I <laughs> Love hate this about you. it. I use it now that I'm 48, uh, soon to be 49, when I wake up at 2.37 and I have to go to the bathroom, I use it 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 to just get out of the damn bed. Because you know what we all do at our age. We yeah. lay there and we're like, okay, just go back to bed, just go back to bed. But you, <laughs> that doesn't work. 47 <laughs> minutes later, you still have to pee. So just 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, get up, go to the bathroom, come back, go to bed, all good. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed that video, by God, please subscribe because I don't want you to miss a thing. Thank you so much for being here. We've got so much amazing stuff coming. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to your friends and your family. I love you. We create these videos for you. So make sure you subscribe. Mwah.